Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the third of our COVID conversations. I'm Helen McShane. I'm Deputy Head of the Medical Sciences Division and Director of the Biomedical Research Centre. I'm absolutely delighted today to introduce Professor Nicole Zitzman, who's going to talk to us about her work on COVID uh, virology. So Nicole is Professor of Virology. She's a head of the head of the Antiviral Research Unit and Director of the Glycobiology Institute. Nicole has a long history of working on viruses such as Ebola, influenza, hepatitis C and HIV, but she's now applying all her techniques and knowledge and all that she knows to identifying new drugs and existing drugs that we can use to treat COVID-19 infection. So Nicole, over to you to give us an overview of the work you've been doing. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Helen, and thank you for inviting me to talk a bit about our contributions here in Oxford uh, to the global efforts that are going on to find a drug that uh, hopefully can help patients suffering with COVID-19. And there are, of course, many groups worldwide who are trying to develop such drug, which is exactly what is needed. We really need to work together to speed up the process. So where would drugs fit into the overall picture when it comes to the current epidemic or pandemic? In our toolbox against this virus, we would ideally want to have a vaccine. So that's what we are all hoping for, because that would hopefully, pro hopefully provide some longer term immunity against this virus. And there are a variety of ways, um, several approaches to make one. And because that will be a, a separate COVID conversation in a few weeks time, uh, I will not go into this at all today. But even before we have a vaccine, we shouldn't be entirely defenseless. And there are at least two more approaches that I've listed here, the convalescent sera you, you could use and you can engineer biologics. These are all uh, also both antibody based and they should be available sooner than a vaccine and could help us tide us over uh, until a vaccine is available. But as I have only 15 minutes, I will also not touch too much on these uh, approaches unless there are questions later. And I will focus instead entirely on these small molecule drugs uh, that people possibly more often will think of when they hear the word drug. So this, for example, here is remdesivir that you might have heard of before. Um, remdesivir and chloroquine being some of these drugs. And of course, what is the problem usually with drug development? So being in the middle of a pandemic is not the best time to start uh, developing a drug from scratch. So as you can see here from usually, uh, identifying small molecules that might be helpful all the way through optimizing it in preclinical uh, phases, going through the clinical phase one, two, and three trials to get a uh, regulatory body approval from the FDA, um, say that can take anything between 10 and 15 years normally. So that is time we just don't have during a pandemic. And of course, the attrition rate is also pretty dreadful. You might start with something like 10,000 compounds to end up with a single FDA approved drug. So in the current situation, we really have to think about uh, something different. And uh, we have really only the time to look at already FDA approved drugs that uh, might be helpful against this particular virus. And this is where my group comes in. So we have started uh, to have a cellular screening assay available where we can hopefully screen some of these already FDA approved drugs and, and just add this very important piece of information, whether these drugs can actually do something about, against this particular, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And then we can feed this piece of information through to our clinical colleagues who need to decide what they might wish to enter quite quickly into clinical trials and into humans. So although we will concentrate only on FDA approved drugs, we still have a big problem, as you can see, there are over 20,000 of those uh, around. And at the moment, even though we now have this wonderful facility available that uh, William James introduced in the last week, the COVID-19 core facility at the Dunn School of Pathology, it is not exactly a high throughput kind of screening setup. At the moment, we are looking at being able to screen something like 25 compounds a month. So how do we get from all these drugs that are potentially available down to what we can more uh, potentially screen? So we need to whittle it down. So my group, there are three ways we went about this. So even before we had the lab and the screen available, my group started uh, reading the literature, following it very closely. There, almost every day there are new publications out of groups all around the world suggesting compounds that might be helpful in the current outbreak. And so we accumulate all this information and all this knowledge and uh, 
and have even at the time started buying in those compounds if you could buy them in. So they would already be in our lab for when the screening uh, lab was opened. So we could do this also with uh, the donation monies that came in to buy these drugs. And so we were very grateful for that. I also then started liaising very closely with our clinical colleagues. I come back to that later and find out what kind of drugs they are interested in because they have their own long list to look at what they might wish to um, bring into the clinic and into humans. So this is a two way, uh, way um, information flow here where we can inform each other. And then when the lab became available, we were also in a position to send out invitations to our colleagues around Oxford and we asked our Oxford PIs and their groups to nominate compounds where they had every reason to believe that they might be helpful in the current situation. So you can see we got nominations from all around the medical science division. So by now we have a list of around 100 compounds and so we still need to filter them into and put them into a, an order that we can actually enter them into our uh, screening pipeline. So as I said, we are concentrating initially on already FDA approved drugs. And amongst those, we are most interested in those that are also already generically available, because you have to think ahead. If you get a positive head, you need something that you could scale up quite rapidly for all the millions of doses that might be necessary. We also then, of course, uh, try to bring our expertise uh, to bear and we try to look at whether the proposed mechanisms by which these drugs might work are, are, are actually credible and we can believe that there might be a chance for these drugs. And some of them will have been tested elsewhere already. And by that, I mean, they might have been tested against individual proteins of the virus already, say the polymerase or the protease, but not yet against the full virus in a cellular assay such as ours. So we come up with an initial um, ranking and then, of course, we hit very pragmatic and immediate uh, problems like how quickly can we get our hands onto these drugs? When can they arrive in our lab and when can we start testing? So at the moment of these 100 compounds, we have 50 already available and 25 are being screened um, at the moment. So when these compounds arrive in my uh, lab, so we have here JL Kiapis, uh, our senior medicinal chemist, uh, preparing the stock solutions. And then we do a quick screen and just to see how toxic these drugs might be on the host cell line that we have chosen to do our screen in. And I come back to this later. And once we have an idea uh, what kind of concentrations we can add, then these things have to go over into the core facility lab, which is in the Dunn School of Pathology that William mentioned last week. This is a fantastic uh, facility to have, and it's the only one I believe in, in Oxford where we can do these screens. It all has to be on containment level three. And so that is uh, one of the things that slows us down and is a bottleneck for these screens. Actually, it's a bottleneck worldwide, really. So uh, here you can see uh, Michelle Hill and Julie Brun from my group. They will enter these drugs into first an initial fast uh, screen, or it's a faster screen. It's a quick look and see yes or no. Will there be any antiviral activity with these compounds? And we end up, I won't go into too much detail with something we call a TCID 50. So if you see here these dark, nice wells, this is where they are happy, healthy cells alive, a monolayer of cells. But when the virus starts uh, killing these cells, you see these white uh, wells here. So you can imagine titrating in a drug, and if you keep these cells alive for longer, then you know that you might have a potential hit. If the drugs don't do anything at this stage, we will stop screening. If there's any uh, reason to believe there might be something here, we will enter them into this much uh, more intricate uh, uh, screen and a uh, full characterization where we drill right down uh, into the details, how this drug, uh, how it works, not, not quite how it works, but you know, how well it works. And we end up with these kind of plug assays. Again, you see this li live uh, cells here and you see these plugs that the virus makes. And we will find out exactly at what concentration of this compound uh, we can kill this virus in cell culture. And we have accumulated all this information of the compounds beforehand. So if we know we are roughly in the right range that where we can be hopeful that we can reach these uh, levels of drug also in humans when we dose these compounds to humans, then we will obviously immediately inform also our clinical uh, colleagues. So I'm in close, I work very closely with Duncan Richards, for example, who is on the clinical oversight committee and who convenes that, that um, uh, oversight committee that Helen McShane also chairs, co-chairs with Keith Shannon. And so that is, they can very rapidly then that take this puzzle, this piece of information and slot it in with all the other information they have. And they could theoretically pull this through into clinical trials really rather quickly. But of course, it is important that all our data will be um, made available very quickly, not only the positive hits, because as I mentioned, worldwide, the screening capacity is a bottleneck. So 
we would like to very quickly make this, uh, we adopted an open science approach. We want to deposit all these data so people can start either developing drug or they don't have to rescreen the same drugs over and over. So for our data management approach, I got a massive amount of help here from Annette von Delft, who works on the translational um, uh, scientist team from the Oxford uh, Biomedical Research Institute and all these uh, amazing helpers, uh, these uh, um, people that work at the Structural Genomics Consortium from the SGC, so that's Lispe, Karina, and Victor. So once Michelle and Julie have screened the drugs in the containment level three facility, they will enter the raw data here onto this collaborative drug discovery database. And once the results become available, we will also then publish them onto our web page here, where thanks to Victor, we now have a SARS-CoV-2 cellular assay tracker. So all our data become immediately available. And it's not just our data. Very importantly, this amazing team <clears throat> is scouring the literature and they find and enter into our database all other cellular screening assays that have already been uh, performed with these kind of drugs. And you can see, for example, here chloroquine, and this is a paper where this, the study is reported and you can go into there and look at all the information that's already been deposited. And then importantly, and that's why I highlight this here, we uh, take one piece of information out straight away in which kind of cell type they have been screened. And for example, here it says chloroquine has been screened in Vero E6s. And so that brings me to a next point about our screening assay. So Vero cells, as you can see here, originally come from the kidneys of African green monkeys. And in order for them to be infectable by SARS-CoV-2, by this virus, they uh, usually need to be transfected with the two human proteins that the virus needs to get into the cells. So these cells are engineered cells on the whole, which would have the ACE2 receptor and the host cell protease, the Tempris2, that this virus needs to get into cells, they will have them expressed. So we try to get away a little bit from these engineered um, monkey kidney cells, and we are using human lung epithelial cells in our screen. In fact, there have been some uh, recent publications directly comparing certain drugs between how they fare against this virus in a monkey kidney cell versus the uh, human lung cells. And most drugs actually are not performing that well once they come into the human lung epithelial cells. Uh, but there are always exceptions and a notable one is actually remdesivir, which did much better in the lung epithelial cells. So it, the whole cell is in, important. Now remdesivir is one of these repurposed drugs I mentioned earlier and repurposed compounds are possibly all we can do in this current uh, epidemic and they are very good to have, but they will never be perfect because they have not been specifically designed against that particular virus, SARS-CoV-2. So remdesivir, uh, for example, was originally an, uh, an anti-HCV drug. It didn't work very well. It was then repurposed already against SARS-CoV-1 and against MERS, so it showed some efficacy. And then it made a reappearance in the 2014-15 Ebola uh, outbreak. And there it had no efficacy, it didn't work against Ebola. But now, again, it's been repurposed and it, it shows some, um, um, it does show some effects. But all to say, repurposed compounds will not be just the perfect compo compounds. And we, they also, because they haven't really been approved for this particular virus, you also have to be wary of the side effects that they might bring with them when you start using them uh, against uh, this particular, in, in COVID-19 cases, especially in, in um, patients suffering from more severe symptoms. So, um, we need to look ahead to the future. We need to start also making novel antivirals, particularly against this virus. And there, here I, I show you a very generic life cycle of a virus. It's not even SARS-CoV-2, but that doesn't matter because these life cycle slides always look the same. And I just want to use this to, to illustrate a point. All the viruses somehow need to get into your cells. So they use your own host cell receptors that to, to get into them. Then they need to replicate their RNA or DNA and they need to make their own proteins. And really importantly, they also need to you know, find, you know, find all these things and put them together and assemble into proper virions, these viral particles here to then be secreted in an infectious form. And I'm just showing you this life cycle slide because it illustrates a very important point in that you can think of antiviral drugs of three different categories. And we are interested in all three different kinds of drugs and we wanna develop all three and we wanna test all three. So, there are the directly acting antivirals, and it's basically, that's what it says on the tin. So these are drugs that would bind directly to virus-encoded proteins, maybe well, best known are the viral protease, viral polymerases, like say remdesivir is one of these compounds, polymerase inhibitor. So 
if a direct acting drug works, they can be, if it's a specific antiviral drug, it can be a very good, uh, very good drug, leading usually to very quick uh, drops in viral titer, so the number of the virus in, in your blood very quickly. But we have also learned from past pandemics that if you go in with uh, a single one of these direct acting drugs, you have to be wary that these viruses mutate very fast and they can mutate around these kind of direct approaches quite quickly. So you would always have to have in mind, we need a combination of drugs. We have to think ahead. We need to make drug cocktails. We need to combine them. Another kind of drugs are the host targeting antivirals. And uh, again, if you identify something that the host cell uh, provides the virus with and that the virus cannot do without and that the virus cannot bring itself. Uh, and if you then identify those kind of uh, pathways in the cell and you inhibit those pathways, you also can make the life and the survival of these viruses very, very difficult. If you find a good host targeting antiviral, there are several advantages with that as well. Viruses cannot mutate very quickly around these kind of approaches because the host is a host and the host is us and the host doesn't change. So we, call, we, we, we talk about a higher genetic barrier to escape mutations arising. Doesn't happen that quickly. And the other very interesting thing about host targeting antivirals is it was very impressive this time how quickly the scientists all around the world managed to find the high resolution structures of the virally encoded proteins. But even that, even no matter how fast you are, it will take you weeks and months to get there. If you find a host targeting antiviral, that targets one of our proteins that you know the viruses need, that drug will already be there. So you don't need to know detailed structural information of a next incoming virus, a next pandemic causing virus. You can already try to give a host targeting antiviral. So ideally you could think of some, maybe combining a direct acting one and a host targeting one. And then there's a third kind of drugs. These are the immunomodulatory drugs. And people might have heard obviously in the news that in some kind of uh, viral diseases, and uh, certainly the most severe form of COVID-19 seems to be one of them, uh, but dengue is another one with a dengue hemorrhagic fever or even influenza, where you could say that it's not actually the virus that kills you. It might be the uh, inappropriate overreaction of your immune system that becomes dangerous to the host and that causes a lot of symptoms and uh, also mortality. So of course, an immune system has to kick in and fight a virus, but in some patients that will uh, overreact and overshoot its mark and you have this excessive uh, uh, activation of the immune system, we call it sometimes, we refer to it as a cytokine storm. And so these kind of drugs, they're there to just lower it back down to a bit more normal. So these drugs would be like the TNF-alpha inhibitors or the interleukin-6 receptor inhibitors, and they're also being trialed already. Okay, so these are the three kind of drugs. And so in my last few um, minutes, I just wanted to uh, show you two approaches where Oxford is looking ahead and what we're trying to do. I, I will start with an amazing uh, um, approach that Gavin Screeton also mentioned in the first uh, COVID conversation. As you remember from my first slides, it usually takes 10 to 15 years to develop something from scratch to a generic drug. So this is Frank von Delft who heads the XCAM facility at Diamond. He's also a group leader at the SGC. And he and his colleagues thought, okay, what would we have to do to generate a generic drug much, much faster, maybe in nine months. And the idea here was to crowdsource, you know, to uh, raise funds by crowdsourcing, but also crowdsource the compound designs and actually the experiments. And so there are over 15 partners involved now. There are only a few uh, of them shown here in the top right corner, that are uh, the core partners. And there are over 400 uh, scientists worldwide involved in this. So Frank and his colleagues, many colleagues in Oxford, uh, it took only two months to make the crystals of this protease, the main protease of the virus, that's a target they choose to attack. And they soak lots of small chemicals into them. They, we call them fragments. These are not drugs yet, they're too small. And Frank likened them to Legos. And then he again crowdsourced out these Lego pieces of Legos. And you can imagine all over the country, medicinal chemists and chemists sitting behind the computer screen, putting these Lego pieces together and designing drug compounds. And they then suggest these drug designs to an online platform that the COVID moonshot project, that's what they, up themselves, provides them with. And then another CRO provides a computing power and artificial intelligence goes through all these designs and decides these are the compounds we can make most fast. And again, CROs are brought in to make these compounds very quickly, very uh, at cost, and again, free from IP. And then these compounds are being fed through again to various places across the world. The Weizmann is screening them. The, by, the chemistry department in Oxford is screening them at the moment under Chris Schofield. And, just yesterday, I got an email from Chris saying that the first compounds are now ready and we're expecting them for our antiviral screening pathway in the Dunn School. 
Okay, so that is a, a very impressive and very fast. And just very quickly, last one, a host targeting antiviral approach that my group has been working on for many years. We, we one of these host um, things that many, many viruses need, and SARS-CoV-2 is one of these viruses that carries a lot of sugars around it. So viruses need sugars for many reasons. One uh, important one is they like to cover themselves in this glycan shield. So when they're out here, the immune system cannot recognize them as, as foreign because they cover themselves in the sugars that are from your own cells. So they look like self. Another reason why they need the sugars is they really, the sugars help to fold the proteins properly. So if you uh, then use a drug that you know, inhibits one of these enzymes that puts the right sugars onto these viral proteins, uh, then you can cause these viruses a lot of trouble. So we use these amino sugars, for example, Mondi and Jay, this pink compound here, you can see it snugly fit into the active site now of a host cell protein here. And if you take this amino sugar and you, for example, treat cells that are infected with virus with an increasing amount of amino sugar, you can see that you're antiviral. Similarly, you can feed these amino sugars to uh, animals that are virus infected and that would normally die of this infection. But if so, you treat them with amino sugars, you can keep them all alive. Mondi and J was only a phase one compound. However, just two days ago, an Italian group reported that another immuno sugar that also came from Oxford originally, NVDNJ, it's already FDA approved and that has shown to be active against SARS-CoV-2 in a Vero cell screen. So as I sit here, we are now rescreening that immuno sugar in our cellular setup. And so I would like to leave you with these messages really that we need more than one drug. We need to think ahead and think of drug combinations. Maybe we can combine a direct acting drug that would could lead to a very quick drop in antiviral tie to the number of viruses, and then maybe put a host targeting one in there to hoover up all the escape mutants. And then also the message that, I hope we can continue this work even when and if this current virus is gone, because one of the problems we have, you know, viruses leave, the funding leaves, and then we cannot continue. And we would be possibly in a much better position if we had continued working on these things after SARS-1, after MERS. And so maybe with your help, uh, we can continue this very important work and just get ready for next pandemics. Because if you think about it, just the last 20 years, three of these coronaviruses jumped the species barriers into us humans and the intervals get smaller and smaller. So thank you for uh, tuning in. Thank you for listening. I hope with your help, we can be better prepared in the next time round. So thank you. Nicole, thank you. That was a lovely overview of the work that you're doing and, and really illustrated some of some of the challenges, but some of the potential opportunities as well. Uh, and I think that was a very, very salutary note to end on um, with the, the comments about the funding and that we'd be in a, a different place if, if funding for previous pandemics had continued. So there are lots of questions that have come in. I'm not sure we're going through them all, but there's, there's an important one, a rather general one, uh, or two that are linked really. So um, somebody is asking, how do we know that the drugs that you are developing are effective across different ages, different genders, different genetic backgrounds? We hear a lot in the press about um, uh, susceptibilities of perhaps different ethnic groups. How do we know that they're going to work across everyone? Or will there be a subset of the population for whom we need different drugs? And how do we, how do we test that in your, your very clever well, actually, our testing setup isn't as clever as you might have thought. So we are starting only on this one cell type, and we are already dreaming about having more sophisticated screening uh, uh, systems available, sharing several uh, cell types, say, as William talked about last time, we would like to combine a, a, a lung cell with a macrophage. So at least we have those two things together, and we can then screen for, for example, the better screen for these immunomodulatory drugs. And then you can dream ahead and we have these organoids keep bringing several cell types together to better represent a real organ in a, in a body. Having said that, the main part of your question, Helen might actually be in a better position to, to comment on because actually we cannot in our, this kind of screen is, which is really geared to have a quick, oh, any of these drugs, could they do anything rather than actually drilling down and will they do something against this or that subpopulation of patients, which are there, which are important and which who will be need to be looked at but i think that possibly will have to be left to the clinical the actual clinical trials in humans we cannot predict that very well so i think i think that's right nicole i think you know you start with providing us with very valuable information to which cells show a, a potential effect on on the virus or alternatively i like the idea that if you can combine various cell types you could actually start to look at the immunomodulatory drugs in your systems too uh, I think that would be that would be a hugely interesting. Um, but then, of course, you feed that information then through to people like me, Duncan, and Keith. So <clears> then, 
design our clinical trials to test drugs that you have identified some, some evidence for us to support those clinical trials. And of course, that is, that is an iterative cycle as well, isn't it? Because we can get samples from those clinical trials and information from those clinical trials that we can feed back to you for further in vitro testing. It's a, it's a wonderful two-way process, I have to say, because uh, the clinicians and also the GPs are interrogating their databases of patients that are already existing, like lots of people being on metformin, but these people tend to be diabetics. And so then coming back and say, please, is metformin antiviral in your screen, but we don't have these comorbidities going on. So just to tease out what would the drug alone do and what would it do in a particular patient background. So this is a two-way information process between you, the clinicians, and us, the basic researchers. Absolutely. Well, as, uh, as I've said previously in, in COVID talks, this is very much about team science and, and working together in a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary way to really maximize uh, our attempts to, to develop drugs and, and therapies for this, for this infection. So there's a question here which links with the comments on cell types. So somebody is asking, what will be your take on targeting macrophages at the alveolar level? Uh, and presumably in part that is delivering a drug not <laughs> systemically into the mouth and orally as we would usually, but actually direct into the lungs uh, with potential drug treatments. Absolutely, that's been very much discussed amongst all of uh, us Oxford PIs. Who, uh, the people who nominate these compounds, they come with these ideas to us and said, look, I think we should be nebulizing this. I think we should uh, look at inhaled drugs and we already have contacts also. So companies who would be able to uh, scale up those kind of uh, products if they were working. We still need to start screening somewhere and starting to screen on a uh, lung, human lung cell is a good start. And as I mentioned, the next thing will be this co-culture that uh, several groups are working on, and William James is one of these groups, and people and his colleagues in the Dunn School, I should also mention, who are already working on getting this kind of co-culture together, you know, the macrophage and the lung cells. And at that point, you can actually really also much more drill into this kind of immunomodulatory thing that's going on from an immune cell being present as well. Fantastic. Now that's that's really important. So obviously this is a global pandemic and global coordination is really important on all levels, on vaccines, on, on drugs and on this kind of testing. Can you tell us how the screening of drugs is being coordinated both nationally and internationally so that we avoid unnecessary duplication and really uh, ensure that we work in a complementary way together? I think I'm, I'm, I'm actually really uh, positive and optimistic about it. I've never seen a pandemic like this, where people are actually starting to work together like this. And I, I thought I brought some of these examples up. People are talking much more across the world. You know, we talk to our colleagues from almost every country. And I have to say, your point is so important. And that's why we adopted this open science approach. Our results, we want to make them immediately openly accessible to all the groups out there trying to find a drug. Other clinicians can help bringing them into clinical trials. Other, other sci uh, basic scientists can take these compounds and try to make them turn them into drugs. It is very difficult. Uh, so all we can do at the moment is throwing them out there on these publicly available databases where other people can help and feed into and maybe also deposit their, their, their information. We are much more linked up than uh, last time round, I would say. But it, it will be absolutely crucial uh, to, to, to us to have a chance in any potentially next pandemic uh, to, to answer faster as we all need to work together. And we need to share our data and we may have to make it publicly available. And, you know, the moonshot I just mentioned was amazing in that so many CROs, so many companies, so many people giving their free time, you know, and there's a lot of intellectual input also just from the chemists and medics and chemists. These are all things they give for free that normally would warrant possibly an authorship on a patent. And they just want yes. to contribute to do it really fast. And the CROs are making this at cost. And they say, no IP. Uh, I think that is really rather heartwarming and... Uh, a very lovely thing to, to see happening. I'm actually very, very positively surprised that it's happening. Absolutely. No, that's, that's a, wonderful, um, a wonderful thing to hear so clearly. So lots of questions about receptors, and we hear a lot in the press about ACE receptors, uh, and, uh, ACE receptor blocking drugs, <laughs> and many people are on for hypertension. Yeah. So so tell us a bit about the state of knowledge on that at the moment and, and where we are with that. Yeah, there's a lot of confusion in that field. And exactly. first of all, if, if this comes from people who are actually on ACE inhibitors at the moment, please continue to follow your medical doctor's advice who knows you and your condition best. I'm not medically trained. But just to say a very important point, these ACE inhibitors uh, that you might be on 
to lower your blood pressure. They are actually not inhibitors of ACE2 at all. So they are ACE1 inhibitors. So these are two totally different uh, enzymes. And in fact, some inhibitors that bind to ACE1 to inhibit this and bring down your blood pressure, they will not bind to ACE2. So it's not, they're not even cross-reacting. That's how different these uh, uh, ACE1 and ACE2 are. However, it is actually a much more complicated story to those people who are used to these very complicated human biology feedback loops, you know, whereas uh, where ACE2 is also in this whole kind of a peptide uh, that so ACE1 the job of ACE1 is to cleave a certain peptide that normally would bind to a receptor that brings your blood pressure up so if you inhibit ACE1 the blood pressure goes down and so if you inhibit ACE1 actually ACE2 levels do go up in response of your body and so initially people were a bit afraid that that would make it worse for the virus but actually there has been another study just out recently saying that that might not be a bad thing that ACE2 goes up to map up all these extra kind of uh, peptides that normally get cleaved by ACE1. So it is a very, very complicated story. Mm. And we need to really, yeah, I think the more patients out there, the, the medics will have to screen that. They know their patients bad and best and they will, after this pandemic is over, they will know whether, you know, it was good or bad. Yes. Uh, and I'm pretty sure what I heard so far, they are not, they're not recommending to go off your ACE1 inhibitor. Uh, at the moment. That's my understanding, but take it as a caveat. That is that is exactly the advice, to continue taking your, your medication. There is no evidence that being on an ACE inhibitor at the yeah. moment. It's, uh, not, it's not against ACE2. These inhibitors do not bind to the receptor. Exactly. Of the that, so that's a really important message. And of course, it does illustrate, you mentioned Julia Hippersley Cox's work and the, and the GP database. It right. illustrates exactly the synergy there with your work and, and <coughs> where you know she is looking at exactly those questions and and you can work with her both on the drugs she identifies that may uh reduce the risk of covid you can then test them in your system but also potentially exactly. you could you could test drugs that may increase the risk of covid as well to to if you like provide biological verification or validation of, of her data yes i'm very much looking forward to this once we are out of the worst of this immediate pandemic yes <laughs> No, absolutely. So an important question here about mutation rates. Do we know, how, do, how, how much do we know about the rate of mutation of this virus and how will that impact on the drugs that you're testing? Yes, so we, so it is a definitely a mutating virus, but how fast that happens, there's a lot of different information out there. It's, 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 uh, I, I cannot give you a, a rate of mutation for this virus. Um, viruses tend to mu uh, mutate around certain drugs more than uh, around other ones, which is why I made this point. Direct acting drugs will be incredibly important. They're usually quite potent and they bring it down. But if you only, if you only hit a virus at a single point, a virus will find a way to mutate around this quite quickly, both in, the, in our cell culture system that happens very quickly, but also in, in, in patients in the clinic, we have seen this. So there is a risk starting with a monotherapy. That's why we need this cocktail of drugs. If you try to attack a virus at many different points of its own protein, so say a protease inhibitor and a polymerase inhibitor, or in my books, ideally also put a host targeting uh, drug into that cocktail because these ones, the viruses cannot mutate around that quickly. And for example, the biologics that I didn't have time to talk about, this kind of, uh, say the uh, ACE2 immunoglobulins that are being developed as well, uh, so that would work against uh, viruses. As long as a virus needs ACE2 to get into the cell, these kind of approaches will be antiviral and they will work, never mind what other mutations go on in that virus. So there are certain things that viruses cannot mutate around as quickly as around other things. And I think we need to keep that in mind when we're designing drugs. Okay, now that's very helpful. And of course, there's a precedent for this because we know from tuberculosis and, and more recently from HIV that if you treat with just one or two, two drugs, then the organism very rapidly develops resistance. Whereas if you treat with three, then uh, that prov provides too much, too high a barrier for, for resistance. So that's right. This, this is new, this is not new. And I remember that in the hepatitis C field as well, it was actually when the first direct acting drugs became available, there was a lot, lot of ethical debate going on. Was it actually ethically okay to go ahead with a monotherapy, knowing full well that that might make that drug useless quite quickly? Or sh does one need to wait? Do different companies need to get together to bring up combination therapies into patients. Yeah, no, abs absolutely. So Nicole, I, I can see that we are running out of time. It's, it's, it's a shame to stop because what you're talking about is so, so fascinating. And I'm sure the, the listeners on the line will be, will be enjoying this in, immensely and as much as I am. But perhaps to finish, you did talk about capacity. 
And obviously you mentioned this is a virus that has to be handled at category three, which is you know, not a trivial bar in terms of laboratory work and, and very much limits the speed with which you can do this important research. So how much is your capacity limited um, and what could you do? What is the most rate limiting step and what could you do if you had more? Yeah, so as I mentioned, we are so incredibly grateful to have access to this one COVID-19 lab that uh, William James and Becky Moore and the Dunn School were instrumental in setting up. It is a bit of a bottleneck, not just in Oxford, it's a bottleneck worldwide, you know, these kind of capacity of screening cellular screens this virus. So we would need more uh, containment level three space available. And in fact, uh, if you can, you know, double, triple this, uh, this amount of space, we would be, we could double and triple our throughput, which at the moment is only 25 drugs in a month. So we are uh, yeah, at the moment actually looking at uh, expanding our capacity and um, Paul Klenemann has very uh, kindly also, and he's also of course working on COVID and is very interested in this, has uh, made a space available also in the Medawar building and we hope that we will soon double our capacity by opening an additional room under the same COVID-19 core lab umbrella um, that is uh, headed by William James in the Dunn School, uh, we will uh, hopefully soon double our capacity. Yeah, it is space, it is training up people to actually have this expertise. And as I said earlier, not losing that expertise in between pandemics would be helpful, you know, just because, you know, a virus comes and goes, goes away, the funding goes away and, you know, everybody has to reinvent the wheel when the next thing hits. Absolutely. Well, that's very clear. Thank you. Nicole, it's, it's 22 minutes past 12, so I should probably let you get back to the lab. <laughs> And, and everyone else on the line get back to what they're doing. But I think thank you so much for, for a really lo lovely overview of, of, of the work that you're doing and, and, you know, the really critical work in trying to identify potent drugs that we can treat this devastating infection with. That was really lovely. Well, thank you. It was an absolute pleasure. And I hopefully thank most people, but many, many people helped in this. So I thank you to all who helped with this. Absolutely. So I think just to, to close this um, third COVID conversation, I think uh, we've had a lovely illustration today of, of, of some of the work that's underway in the university. There are a huge number of researchers across the whole of Oxford working on a range of projects um, and really donations of any size are very welcome to support this, this research. It's all, much of it is being done at risk. Uh, we're all writing grants frantically, but actually uh, you know, that you can you can see already that, that the ideas and what we can do is racing ahead of the available money at the moment. There is a link in the description below the video if, if people are interested in donating. Um, and I'd like to also draw your attention to the next talk, which will be on immunology. I'm sure this will be equally fascinating with Professor Paul Klenemann. Um, and again, the details of that talk will be um, on the web page below the description, uh, below the video. Um, so it, it just really leaves me to thank you all very much for watching uh, and uh, we look forward to doing this again shortly. Bye bye.